Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings and regards from the land of Lord Jagannath. Gratitude, AI, was for the opportunity. Is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes, perfect. Right. So I've been asked to dwell into the technological frontiers from PCI to stress source OCT technologies, and I urge everybody to take the dive with me into the frontiers first and then on the machines and the clinical applications. The first biometer that ever came into the market and Zeiss has to be credited for bringing it to our notice was based on the technology called partial coherence interferometry. It utilized a light source called MMLD, multimedia light display. As you can see, the wavelength is peaking at several, uh, several points with a gap in between them. The wavelength was 780 nanometers and this is the only concept which utilized two mirrors one of them is a moving mirror, the other is a fixed mirror. The light source emanates light, which gets reflected, of, uh, which gets divided by a, a beam splitter into two halves. Both the light fragments then enter the subject's eye. Then they get reflected by another angulated beam splitter to be caught by a photodetector device to give us the reading of different distances between different tissues. The data it exhibited was not it's easier said than done because what we are measuring is the, the distance between two structures in the presence of a cataractus lens. So it does not produce a smooth wave or a smooth peak like this. It produces a bizarre spiked wave pattern like this, which is a serrated, which has a serrated look. Now the machine did have a technology to convert this bizarre looking waves into one single crisp and clear wave pattern. They utilized a technology called composite signal and they improved the signal to noise ratio. Now to understand this, we have to understand what is signal and what is noise. Signal is what comes from the subject's eye. Noise is what is produced inside the machine and from the opaque optical media. The machine had the capability of filtering the signal from the noise and thereby improving the numerator and thereby improving the signal to noise ratio. It will be further exemplified in this picture Keep an eye on these two columns right at the right at the right hand corner. As we improve, as we go on taking repeated measurements from one to 20, keep an eye on the signal to noise ratio. And you would see that this bizarre looking wave pattern now gives us a clear, unified, significantly tall retinal spike as the signal to noise ratio keeps on improving. So this was actually a breakthrough technology which was used by this machine to give us accurate measurements. It did give us very good data with very good uh, uh, probability ratio as well. The axiometry was superb with this machine, but where it faltered was the keratometry, which was largely reflectometer based. And it also had white to white and anterior chamber tests, which were approximations rather than measurements. And it also did not give us the lens thickness, which was all important for the modern day formula to use. So to correct that, the next platform came in, which was optical low coherence reflectometry ut utilized by Lensstar LS900. It had only one reference mirror instead of two. The light source was the light source was a super luminescent diode which has which had a single uh, peak. The wavelength improved to 820 nanometers, which improved the penetration. It also had waveforms coming from the subject's eye which were matched with a reference wave, which was incorporated into the database of the machine. Both of the waves underwent Fourier transformation to give us a single A-scan curve. Now the advantage of the single A-scan curve is we can determine the distance between any two peaks and which can give us things like the pachymetry, the anterior chamber depth and the lens thickness. However, both of these concepts had some fallacies. We wanted to improve on the accuracy we wanted the penetration to be better because both of these machines failed when the cataract was more in density. And we also wanted a faster scan speed and an examiner bath elimination to achieve all that came in the step source OCT. The light source in here exceeded in its wavelength. It went up more than 1000. It also had a single mirror and the beam splitter produced two waves which were detected by the photo detector device, just like any other thing. But it's called step source because the wavelength sweeps across a 50 microns, uh, uh, 50 microns uh, 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 zone from 1030 to 1080. Now let's look at the machine. We will understand this better when we look at the machine characteristics. The step source OCT is utilized by three, at least, if not more machines. I would, I use two of them, so I would speak of two of them. 
IL Master 700 was a pioneer which brought in the technology. You can see that the predictability and the repeatability data is very, very good into the decimals up to two digits beyond the decimal. This, what it does is the machine divides the eye into six meridians located at 0, 30, 60, 90, 120, and 150. It scans each of these six meridians, take 128 scans in each meridian and repeats them three times. So it takes 2000 scans per second at the blink of an eye and produces a single B scan image like this. So we can measure any distance, any point to any point to give us central corneal thickness, ACD, AQD, lens thickness, and action length as well. The other thing it does is it also green marks the different semicircular contours like the anterior and the posterior lens capsules are also marked green. It has its clinical implications as you will see a little later. It has a distant independent keratometry. Once you've measured the keratometer independent of the distance between the examiner or the machine and the eye, it always would produce the same result. So it is distant independent, thereby it eliminates the subject, uh, uh, the subjective uh, bias on this. I think Dr. Nathan would have a video to showcase this. It also measures white to white. And apart from white to white with this optical, optical cursors, what it also gives us is how much the image at the center of the visual axis is displaced in terms of or with relation to this, the periphery of the iris in, uh, uh, and the periphery of the pupil. So we can have a fair bit of idea where the angle alpha and the angle kappa would be, though it doesn't give us the distance calculated uh, in terms of root mean square. The machine has uh, in its database different eye models pertaining to different age groups of the patients. So the moment you punch in the date of birth of the patient in question, it automatically calculates what should be the signal to noise ratio it should employ to calculate the axial length in that particular patient. It also has a fixation check. It takes the center of the fovea, gives us this picture on the screen so that we can cross check where the light has echoed from. And the central one millimeter area is where it scans. It takes 256 scans of the same point and repeats it five times. So there's the accuracy level is very, very high as far as this is concerned. The other SSOCT based machine that I use is coming from the uh, uh, group of Heidelberg Engineering. It's called Anterion. It's called two technologies apart from SSOCT. It also has the ray tracing. It has tomography. It has enormous data points. It takes 16,000 data points to just to give us the keratometry. It has an exceedingly good uh, and anterior segment OCT as well, as well as uh, angle metrics. Excellent machine to work with. This is the printout that comes from the machine. It also gives us an A scan in a divided setting. One, the anterior, the other, the posterior. There is a spike from which the machine has supposedly taken the reading from. It has different quality checks as well, as we will see a little while later. Fantastic machine to work with. But when it comes to biometry and biometry alone, leave aside the other uh, ornaments, the anterior in my clinical practice always subjugates the IL Master 700. So that always stands as the primary biometry machine. However, this is an excellent subjugate to work with. There are a few reliability indicators when we work with the 700, and these are those. Uh, this is one keratometric reading from one patient. As you can see, here the delta is shown to be 0.27, but when we look at the keratometric wires, we can see a cross there. So they should always be cross-checked, in particular when we are planning a toric because these three measurements are from the single patient in a single setting. As you go down, you see the delta has gone up to 1.5. So this patient is suitable to receive a toric implant. However, the first measurement did not show that. So we should always cross check that the machine has the ability to do that. We should check the foveal pit from where the light has echoed. If there's no foveal pit, then the, uh, the reading should not be taken. Herein, the foveal pit is being shown and uh, the measurement shows that the difference between the two keratometric, uh, two keratometric readings, 0 0.02, we should discard if it's more than 0 0.05. And when it comes to axiometry, the difference between them should be less than 20 microns, which this particular patient is, is exhibiting. So as a result, we can see the IL powers are showing similar values in both the calculations in both the eyes. But on the other hand, if we take another patient into question where the foveal pit is not visible, it should be discarded. So it should be when the difference between the two uh, delta values is exceeding 0.2, it is 0.5 in this case, and the difference in axiometry exceeds 
190 microns. So obviously this finding should also be discarded. But if we go ahead and calculate, we can see a one dot difference between the two alphas, which is definitely not to be considered. This is the reliability or indices of the anterior, which shows here the acquisition quality. As you can see, there are various parameters here, including right in the middle, the tear film and the lid uh, uh, the tear film validity is also there. So if it is borderline, you can still go ahead and accept it. If it is not a borderline and if it's poor, then the machine always cautions you against taking that reading into account and planning your IOL uh, with that. Let's look at a few examples in terms of clinical application. The first three patients belong to, the first three examples belong to three patients in whom I missed important clinical data, important clinical observations, and had posted them for cataract surgery. My optometrist, after subjecting all three of them, came back running to me and said, there's something fishy going on at the retina level. Please do an OCT. We did an OCT when we found this. In this particular patient, when I had missed and the optometrist caught it. The next patient, also something similar. I had missed this or during my clinical examination, the optometrist caught it and we did an OCT and found this. So these are all unhealthy patients to be subjected to cataract surgery at least without taking an opinion from the retinologist colleague. And that's what we did. This is the third patient. Once again, I had missed a full thickness macular hole, which the optometrist caught looking at the contour of the phobia and which was subsequently confirmed on OCT. Uh, this is what you see when you take the, uh, take the B-scan picture from a 700. As I told you, it green marks the contour of the anterior and the posterior capsules. This was a posterior polar cataract. And somehow I would not convince that this posterior capsule is showing a good contour. I subjected the patient to an anterior segment OCT. And what you can see here, the posterior capsule is actually deficient in the middle and the cortex is protruding. So is the posterior polar plaque. So you have to make necessary arrangements as the case may be inside the OT to tackle the situation. The 700 also gives us a clue to the IOL tilt. Remember, if the lens shows a little bit of tilt and you have a doubt, and with that, the foveal pit does show a good fixation. You should always suspect a lens tilt. That's what happened in this patient of mine. I did have my doubts about this particular IOL being in position. I did an anterior segment OCT, which also showed that the axis of the lens is not corroborating with the axis of the eye. It's a little tilted. Interested, I, sub I evaluated the patient further. I took him on Varian, and the Varian suggested that this patient needs a toric implant. I was not at all convinced I subjected the patient at last to eye trace, which showed that there are vividly increased values, internal values of uh, coma and trefoil, which always suggests a lens tilt. And if you look at the trace, the refraction here at the pupillary plane, it shows a minus 20 cylinder. So this IOL was tilted, this IOL was dislocated, subluxated to an extent. So I made necessary arrangements inside the OT with Ahmed segment and CTR and went ahead with the uh, a normal monofocal implant. This was a patient who had who needed a, an expand series IOL implant, a high myopic, and a minus two adapters was what, suge what was suggested by the variant to be the perfect IOL for this particular patient. This 700, however, suggested a minus one in the uh, in the expand series. My 0.93 was the emetropic thing. And when we subjected the patient to an online uh, Barrett's formula calculation, it also suggested a minus two. Now in this, I learned a few things and I always employ that in my clinical practice, hence on, whenever I have a high myopic patient who needs, who needs particularly a meniscus lens and negatively part lens, I always take the reading of the IL Master 700 to be the final reading. I do not consider the machines, the other readings that come in even from an, uh, from an online calculator, even if the formula that is essentially used for calculations is the same. This is another patient who had undergone LASIK but we have intentionally not told the machine that the patient has undergone laser vision correction. We just did the biometry, but the machine caught that the patient has undergone uh, uh, the laser vision correction and gave us an IOL power, which was absolutely in the normal range. Um, lastly, we will talk about a silicon oil filled eye. We did not tell the machine, we told the machine that is filled with vitreous bodies, so it did not do its adjustments and the calculated IL power came out to be minus eight, uh, plus 18.5. And then we all we, we subject, we provided the machine with the accurate data. We did say that the uh, patient has silicon oil in place. And then 
the IL power K uh, was 21.5. Even Zeiss functionaries do not know how the machine is incorporated to the technology of changing its parameters once you tell the machine that it's a silicon oil filled globe. But if you compare it with the other eye, the power essentially comes out to be the same. So these are a few settings wherein this particular machine is very uh, efficiently uh, working and active. Thank you so much for the opportunity, AIOS, ma'am. I sign off with this note. I think, Anurag, that was a